15,000 labour activists. I'm Apsana Begum and this event is hosted by Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas, along with the Labour Assembly for Against Austerity and our media partner, Labour Outlook. This is the latest in a number of events, which is which it's hoped will facilitate in-depth discussion and socialist political education. And all around the world, governments, including our own, are still failing to protect health and people in this pandemic. And our government is one of those that has failed here and also you know, most resorted to scapegoating to distract their disastrous handling of the pandemic. They failed to stop the spread of the virus getting out of control again, and they failed to give people the economic support they need. So as we'll hear tonight, statutory sick pay remains at a disgraceful level, and they remain obsessed about privatization and outsourcing of our public services, despite the disaster of Circle with track, track and trace. This discussion then is particularly important, and it's also important that we look into the future and think about the kind of economy and society we need and a society that we want. Now, due to the amazing level of interest uh, for this event, as well as this uh, um, webinar tonight, we are streaming live direct from Arise YouTube page and over a dozen Facebook pages. And as the event goes on, please feel free to post questions in the comments below on the streams and in the Q&A section on Zoom itself. And we will put some of those questions to our panel. Please also donate at the link provided on Arise so we can continue hosting these important events. And please sign and share the people's plan that we are promoting, which is, you know, uh, which, you know, an amazing 11,000 Labour members actually, and numerous MPs like myself have signed so far. Our speakers for this vital discussion on the crisis and the recovery we will need um, will um, uh, have eight minutes. Uh, to speak and we will then move on to your questions. So I want to begin uh, by inviting Sarah Woolley uh, from the Bakers Union and she's the General Secretary of the Bakers Union to uh, speak and, and respond to what we've seen today in terms of the spending review and what it really means for the recovery that the People's Plan is trying to promote um, across the country. So thank you so much Sarah for joining us and over to you. Thanks, Apsana, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I'm going to concentrate, if I may, on the sorry state of statutory sick pay and touch on the campaign that we at the Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union have launched around it. We found through the pandemic many employers are paying their staff statutory sick pay when self-isolating, which is pushing them into poverty, especially that they've had to do it more than once as breakouts have occurred on site or someone in their household has shown symptoms. And as such, those employers have shown us their true colours, that they truly put making profit before the safety and health of the people that work for them, even in a global pandemic. And, and our members through the main have worked throughout this pandemic, keeping the nation fed. And whilst it was brilliant to see them recognised as the key workers they are, being labelled as key workers is all well and good. But in reality, for many of our members, the, the reality for many of our members is that their treatment during the pandemic couldn't be any further away from what you may expect for a key worker, especially those in unrecognised workplaces. We've seen examples of members being forced to isolate due to breakouts of COVID places in their workplaces, yet expect to survive on statutory sick pay at £95.85 and pence a week, which barely covers the rent, never mind anything else. And we've seen full households of our members that all work at the same place, having their wages slashed as each of them are about to isolate due to being in contact with a positive case or through one of them displaying symptoms. And by doing the right thing by staying at home, they've been penalised for doing so financially. Statutory sick pay is a very real issue for our members and it has been for a long time, especially for those, as I mentioned earlier, in unrecognised workplaces, those on part time or low contracted hours and for those on zero hours contracts especially. For many of our members, their wages are the only income they have. We've got many migrant workers who don't have access to the full range of benefits British nationals have. For example, the changes to housing benefits stops them from being able to claim it, despite the myths and lies from the right-wing media suggesting otherwise. Also, the flaws in the universal credit system, which have worsened through the pandemic from the extra volume of people trying to claim it, mean that even those who can claim it for support receive it far too late to make a difference. 
leaving many relying on 95 pounds and 85 pence a week or even nothing if they don't mean the lower earnings threshold which affects over 2 million workers in the UK. How is that even right in 2020, never mind whilst we are living through a, a global pandemic? And this is why it's important to be in a trade union and if you're not in one and watching this, please join one and organise in your workplace and encourage your friends and your family to as well. The Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union, along with a number of other unions and Don't Leave Organise, have launched a campaign to improve statutory sick pay. As we all know, £95 and £85 a week is simply not good enough. In fact, it's shameful. It's the equivalent to just 29% of average pay. And this compares unfavourably to comparable schemes in the rest of Europe, where sick pay, for example, covers 100% of average pay in Germany, 93% in Belgium, 64% in Sweden, 56% in the Netherlands and 42% in Spain. We are calling for the government to legislate for full rights to at least six weeks of contractual sick pay for all workers from day one at 100% of wages. The scheme will be funded by those employers not currently paying company sick pay for the first six weeks, so there's no extra burden on the taxpayer, and those already doing the right thing and paying company sick pay would continue to do so or have to contribute as well if they decided that they were going to stop doing the right thing. After six weeks, statutory sick pay will kick in for 28 weeks at an increased rate in line with other benefits such as maternity pay. Those on zero hours contracts or short contracted hours would receive pay based on an average of the last 12 weeks. Because as a union, we strive to improve the lives of people working in our industry. We believe this campaign will do just that. When people are ill with COVID or any illness, the last thing they need on top of that is the additional stress and worry about how they are going to eat or pay the bills or simply just survive. So please get on board and help us to hold those businesses to account that have made money through this pandemic yet have treated their staff appallingly, putting their health and the community's health at risk in order to make a few extra pounds for the shareholders. Join a trade union and let's make things better together. We are the 99% and we deserve better than we're currently getting from the shambles of a government. And on that note, if I can very quickly, uh, speaking of a shambles of a government, this government, as we know, has made the decision to cut union learning funding from March 2021. This fund helps 200,000 people, members and non-members on average a year, upskill in areas like English, maths, mental health, workplace skills, redundancy support, amongst others. Please sign the TUC petition. There are currently over 42,000 signatures, but we need more. And also encourage your MP to sign the early day motion as there are currently only 87 on there. We need to stand together and support the Union Learning Fund to make sure workers aren't left out in the cold. Furlough may have been extended, but unemployment is still at an all time high and rising. And this decision by the Tories is simply just another political attack on our class that we cannot just let go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, and you highlight so much in there for everyone to take away. Um, I was I was just thinking about what you said about statutory sick pay and, you know, the, the ability for the government, you know, which should be there to really support people to self-isolate. And if we look at, you know, the mass testing program that's, you know, been talked about uh, by the government, um, but what we can see, you know, even in Liverpool, where, where it was being tested and rolled out, um, people are, the feedback there seems to show that people are still not self-isolating because you know they don't feel that they've got the economic and financial support to be able to do so and i think you know that's that's also going to be the case probably around the country unless we really see that real investment to really protect people and to feel that you know at the end of them self-isolating they'll have a job to go back to um i just wanted to also ask i mean sarah very quickly i mean one of the things that i was looking at earlier today was about the women's from, was from the women's budget group and, you know, the national living wage is, you know, the increase to that would have been a positive development for women. And I just wondered, you know, in terms of your members, I, I'm assuming this, this figure that I looked at, which is, you know, that 69% of low paid workers um, are, um, are from black, Asian, ethnic minority and, and um, backgrounds and migrant women. And I thought, you know, well, actually, I wondered, is that also reflected in your union and and you know what are they sort of saying in terms of their experiences of working in the food sector yeah i mean we already in the food sector are in a low paid industry with with precarious contracts um 
and we cover members in the hospitality industry, which are, which is even worse. And um, it, the, the announcement today does disproportionately affect women, but especially being women, you know, um, and there's no getting around that. It's a political choice not to put the national living wage up, and it's certainly not going to help the economy by not giving low paid workers an increase. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you for all the work that you're doing at the union as well. So next, I'm going to come to Pascal Robinson, who uh, is from We Own It, who has been doing a lot of work to highlight uh, the failures of tra track and trace, should I say circle track and trace, um, has been you know, really highlighting the problems that we've got in terms of uh, the, the contracts that are being given out by the government as well. And so it'd be really good to hear from her and what, what she, she's got to say. So over to you, Pascal. Thanks so much, Apsana. Um, just to introduce We Own It quickly, uh, we're a voice for public service users and we run campaigns for public ownership of public services because we believe that we use them, we pay for them and therefore we should own them. So we've had several victories, including winning our campaign to stop the privatisation of the body NHS professionals, winning a victory on getting the East Coast Railway line brought back into public control and most recently getting uh, probation brought back into public ownership. But We've got a long, long way to go to getting well-funded, world-class democratic public services in public hands run for our communities. And I wanna to speak today a bit about why any people's plan, any recovery plan must prioritize investing in our public services and bringing them back into public control and ownership immediately. It's clear that privatization of our public services is a joke. It's a scam that rips off our communities and privatized services and markets have failed to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. And they left our public services creaking before the pandemic. The cuts and outsourcing meant that we weren't ready. We lost 44% of general and acute beds in the NHS between 1987 and 2019. And we then gave private hospitals extortionate amounts to rent out beds that should have been in our health service anyway. Similarly, when it came to getting health workers PPE, our NHS supply chain was privatized in 2006 and it was a mess. Movianto was given a 55 million pound contract to provide a stockpile of equipment, most of that PPE in the case of a pandemic. But according to delivery drivers, uh, Movianto weren't ready due to bad management of the stock and short staffing at its chaotic custom built warehouse. Much of the stock was out of date and there had been smoke damage and asbestos worries before, uh, before the pandemic hit. And that's why we did a, a report into the NHS supply chain privatization. But those are just two failures among a list of hundreds that have put people at risk. The pandemic has gone some way to putting our priorities as a society into perspective. And it's clear that it's public services and public infrastructure that have saved lives during the pandemic. And that unless all of us are safe, none of us are safe. 6% of the UK public want us to return to a pre-pandemic economy. That's according to Build Back Better polling. And polling shows that more than, more than three quarters of us believe that our NHS and education are the same or have become worse in the last 10 years. So there's huge appetite, appetite for change, but we simply won't get the decent public transport, green energy, clean rivers, good hospitals or schools without public ownership. And a majority of the UK public have long recognized that. It's extremely popular public ownership with leavers and remainers, the young, the old, across political divides. And even a majority of conservative voters want public ownership of rail and water. It's not a nice to have, it's an agenda that will transform our society and bring people together. Public support for public ownership only increased further during Corbyn's time as leader. He brought public ownership into the mainstream and gave it airtime with the 2017 manifesto. And we saw support for renationalizing Royal Mail and buses increase by at least 7%. And the support, um, the increase in support happened in the face of a barrage of right wing media claims that Corbyn and McDonald's plans to copy countries like Ireland and France in running services directly were radical, direct and extreme. But that was simply a well resourced lie. The truth is that the UK is wasting 13 billion pounds every year on privatisation. That's money that goes to shareholder dividends, fragmentation and the higher cost of borrowing in the private sector. And at the moment, our public services are simply a cash cow for the wealthy. As we've seen, track and trace should be run 
in public hands. It's a public health need. But instead, it's, it's something for Serco to further get its teeth into our health services. We can't afford to believe the lies that there aren't enough money, that there isn't enough money after this pandemic. Despite the pandemic resulting in business closures and job losses, the Bloomberg ind index has collectively gained $1.3 trillion. And while public sectors make up 5.5 million and 17% of the workforce, they've seen a freeze today. It's absolutely shocking. We should be strengthening those jobs, paying them properly, properly and adding new jobs in areas like care work, buses and energy. They found the magic money, money tree to give millions to their mates to source PPE when they had no experience in this work. They found the money to set up a parallel testing network when they could have expanded NHS labs. And they found billions to prop up failing rail, rail companies. So we know that investing in public services and people after the pandemic is popular and it's a question of priorities. But what is the plan for investing in those services? Here are three of the key priorities that we see um, towards us getting a world where services are actually run for people and not profit. Number one, we need a new deal for our health services. Labour's biggest legacy at the next election could be protecting the NHS from further privatisation and pushing the government to reverse the creeping privatisation, underfunding and cuts. We need also a national care service available to all who need it and Scotland is said to be considering this, making sure that the devastating mistreatment doesn't happen again. Number two, we need to push for a Green New Deal because the crisis of the climate emergency is already here and it's, it's affecting millions of people, especially in the global south. Public ownership can create hundreds of thousands of jobs in generating energy and green new industry supply chains. Wind and solar power can be delivered almost everywhere in the UK and it would reverse decades of underinvestment that we've seen in communities decimated by Thatcher. And groups like Green New Deal UK and other groups are organising for this right now. They've highlighted that public service jobs are green jobs and jobs that are about caring for people. And these are the kinds of jobs that we need in our economy moving forward. We shouldn't be underpaying people and cutting those jobs. We also need public control of our bus networks to ensure that we have services that work for our communities, rather than the current situation where outside of London, routes are only run for profit. And there are campaigns again for this all over the country, like Better Buses for Greater Manchester and Better Buses for West Yorkshire. We've given over a billion to bus companies, and yet we've asked for nothing in return. We should be having an equity stake in bus companies so that we have control over our services. And this will be crucial to getting expanded public transport that gets people out of their cars. We can't simply replace cars um, with lithium battery electric cars. We need a complete step change. And similarly, the railway is a natural monopoly where passengers don't have any real choice as consumers. And marketised rail systems have driven down prices and, improve, and not improved the quality of services. Lastly, I just want to say that I think we should have to, we need to reform media ownership if we're going to get the government we need. We need social media platforms that work for people and we need a properly funded BBC that we can actually hold accountable and laws to rein in the right wing press. Labour needs to campaign for me media reform because it can't wait another five years. The misleading discussions around public ownership that saturated the media during the last election are proof of this. The government seemed to want to keep giving private companies handouts, asking them to wait in the wings until this is all over so that they can come out again and resume profiting from us. But there's no doubt that the political space has opened up. The left should be telling the story of COVID-19 and creating a new narrative out of the wreckage that does justice to our public services and why and how we should value them. And we need to demand a lot because they, they don't have a vision. It's only with public services and public hands that we'll be able to meet the challenges. And I, for one, can't wait to work with everyone on this call to achieving that. Thanks so much, Pascal. That was so insightful. And, you know, you really gave us real sort of practical steps and things that we should be going away and pushing for us as parliamentarians and us as activists. Absolutely. And I just was thinking about the fact that, you know, even just a few days ago, um, even Ofgem was is, is starting to propose that every single household pay an extra 21 pounds charge and, and have that on their energy bills from next April to cover the increasing levels of bad debt. So, you know, in other words, for everybody that's, you know, joined us today, I mean, that's that's to compensate for, um, compensate supplies for other households uh, who aren't able to pay their bills as COVID is obviously increasing um, unemployment. So, so, you know, we can see all these different sectors and all these areas which, you know, which really need to be brought back into public ownership. 
Um, we've got questions coming through on, on our various streams. So um, we've got one which is asking, you know, how can we make the case for public ownership in a way that people understand will benefit them financially, but in terms of services as well? Because I think, you know, there's sometimes this misconception uh, maybe that, you know, if we bring uh, services back into public ownership, then it might just not have the quality of, of service and fulfilled needs um, as needed. Yeah, completely. So the way we talk about it is, is about universal access and money that is pr currently going to shareholders being reinvested back into the service. We need to massively upgrade our railways. We need to upgrade our, our water systems as well. They're creaking at the seams and this money could be spent on improving those services. And I think we we always try it, we own it, to talk about the, the everyday ways that it will improve our lives. Um, of course, our NHS is, is one of the best examples of a public service. Our education is being privatised all the time, but that is also an example of something that's run for public goods. And the reason people support public ownership so much is because they want to see uh, their, their taxes, they want to see their money going into services and improving people's lives. Um, so I, I think that there's loads more to be done, but I think clear and simple and engaging and, and talking exactly about the concrete ways, um, it will make things better is the way to go. Thanks so much, Pascal. And I was just thinking about the Chancellor's statement earlier today and you know what you said about controlling the narrative or you know taking charge of that and media ownership and investing in that as as the left and as as socialists it's so important um the two words that kind of did stick out in in terms of the statement you know they talked about tougher tough choices you know and these are tough choices that are needing to be made and you know we've got to spin that around haven't we you know we've got to talk about well is it tough choices for, for you know for public sector workers to have a pay freeze you know that's tough choices for them that they're going to have to grapple with it's tough choices for the domestic abuse victims that will be you know stuck through ongoing restrictions throughout the next year that have not had any commitments uh, you know in this uh, spending review so so it's really important as you say to try and make sure that we you know uh, control the narrative and, and you know look at you know reviewing our public broadcasting and, and really push that high up on the agenda for for us um in labor thank you so much pascal and um i'm going to now um come to matt wilgress from arise who's uh, going to uh, give us uh, a bit of an understanding uh, more about labor against um austerity and and the assembly and and you know how we can get involved um and how we can influence uh, these really really good ideas that are coming through this evening so um over to you matt thank you absana and thank you for your wonderful chairing and everything you do to support us it's so great we're so grateful here and isn't it wonderful to see after our left leadership of the labor party from 2015 all these new socialist MPs like Sara and Apsana and Bell and so many others taking the fight to the Tories in the chamber every day and not letting these hideous Tory backbenchers bully them when they do it. Um, also a big thank you to our two speakers so far. The, the work the Bakers Union doing is so inspiring and they're so heavy hitting in our movement and of course we own it. I think everyone is starting to realise just how much they're impacting the debate on so many issues from Serco through to railways and much more besides. Um, as is sort of my usual role at these events now, um, I'm doing sort of the practical and financial announcements from my front room. Um, so if you can make a donation, please do on the link provided and I'll explain a bit more why we need that at the end. In terms of practical points, and this I hope you address some of the things in the questions. Firstly, as people know, this meeting was originally called as a sort of rally for our people's plan. Um, it's actually a coincidence it ended up on the day of the spending review, but it certainly helped the discussion and the publicity. If you haven't signed the people's plan, please do. Over 17,000 Labour members from across the country have signed it from over 500 CLPs, which I think makes it the biggest thing of this kind in responding to the crisis. But we all know that we need to get a lot more reach than that if we're going to... Um, really put these positive changes on the agenda in the party and beyond, so please do that. Secondly, um, we have a petition about universal credit. It wasn't covered much today, but Annalise Dodds did a good job in mentioning it, which is there's um, 
are due to be a cut of £20 to universal credit in April. And we really need to step up the pressure now before April to make sure that cut doesn't take place. There's for over 5,000 people on our petition, which you can see the link for being posted now. Please sign it, but also please share it because what we need more than just adding our own names is to reach different people, people on your social media, people you know at work and so on. Please do back that. Um, a third thing is a quick plug up for our media partner, Labour Outlook. We have um, over 100,000 people engaging now most weeks with Labour Outlook. Three of our columnists, Apsana, Richard and John McDonnell, are on the call. We also have now regular columns from Kate Osborne and John Trickett as well. So that's um, a campaign group MP every Sunday on Labour Outlook. Please do follow and read our materials. And then two quick things. One thing, obviously, that there's a lot of talk about isn't the main topic of today's discussion. There's a lot of talk about in the chat and on the questions. It's the ongoing situation around Jeremy Corbyn and having the whip restored. There's a petition that you can sign at nearly 50,000 people. Um, 50,000 people have signed, which you can see the link for. And also there's a joint rally between Momentum and Arise this Saturday at five o'clock, which I think Aksana is doing a sterling job speaking at that as well. So please do join that. And then finally, just to say, um, I know people who regularly come on these calls can get a bit bored of it, but please do donate if you can. Um, as people know, we're running multiple events each month, and this does cost significant amounts of money for restreaming devices, for Zoom webinar, for email servers, and so on. So please do donate £10 of what you can afford using the link provided. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. That was that was really, really helpful. And I think so much there for everyone to take away, starting, you know, with uh, following up uh, the pages on, on Facebook and on YouTube, um, and also signing the petition to reinstate Jeremy Corbyn. And, you know, we've not gone away and we're here and, and you know, it's amazing to see uh, over 500 people watching from Cornwall all the way to, you know, Cambridge, Edinburgh. Um, you know, there's so many activists and members that have joined us this evening and it's really, really good to see uh, that you know there is enthusiasm for this discussion on a people's plan. So um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker who did a sterling job, I think, uh, representing uh, the socialist gender and, and uh, the socialist plan for a people's plan, um, and responding to uh, you know the the spending review and and the um, the government's plan. Uh, for the economy early this morning on BBC Politics um, and uh, continuing to uh, defend us and defend um, members who really are committed to the commitments that we all made um, in the 2019 Labour Party manifesto. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Richard Bergen, who is also the Secretary of the Socialist uh, Campaign Group of Labour MPs. Thank you, uh, Apsana. Thanks to all the other speakers. Thanks to Matt for the sterling job you do uh, in organising the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. And thanks to everybody out there at home, across the country, and maybe in other countries as well, who've tuned in tonight. It's great to uh, be with you. And I want to also pay tribute really to Apsana because it's obviously a time when people are feeling... Uh, pretty down on the left of the Labour Party. But when we're feeling a bit down about the political situation within the party and outside the party as well, we can look at those fabulous new MPs like Apsana and take uh, real courage. Apsana is a fantastic uh, socialist MP and what Apsana has been doing uh, since, she, since, since she's been uh, elected really sets a great example uh, to us all and we'll need uh, Apsana and others both inside Parliament and outside Parliament in the huge struggles that are ahead uh, inside the party but also outside the party in the wider crisis so it's a great uh, pleasure and since I've paid her a compliment she might not uh, stop me if I run, run over my time who knows as chair but over a million people have lost their jobs since the crisis began. And young people, as we know, have been hit the hardest. But it's going to get a lot worse, I'm afraid, uh, unless we take part in the fight of our lives and do so successfully. Today left no one in any doubt that a huge fight is now underway over who will pay for this crisis. That's why my message to everyone on this call is that the Labour Party alongside the wider Labour movement, should have as an absolute priority in this period, ensuring that this crisis is not paid for on the backs of the working class. That's the fight we're in, whether the deepest 
economic crisis and generations will be paid for by those who have already lost out through a decade of frozen wages, a decade of public service cuts, and four decades of extreme free market policies, or whether it's paid for by those who've done so well out of this rotten system, the billionaires, the super rich, the corporate elite and outsourcers with connections to the Tory party and the tax dodgers. The spending review today is just the latest evidence of the direction that this government wants to go in. A pay cut for millions of public sector workers, the benefits of millions, largely sick and disabled people, rising by just 37 pence a week. Promises about the uh, increase in the national minimum wage abandoned. And we saw as well how they want to get away with this by the typical Tory game of divide and rule. Today, the Tories pitted or tried to pit public sector workers against private sector workers. But we've seen, haven't we, where this goes. Next, it'll be scapegoating migrants and then so-called benefits scroungers. So we need to stand up as a movement to the scapegoating and to the division and offer an alternative, an alternative that inspires people, one that people can rally around to unite with us to force change. Because that's the only way that we're going to get anything to the largest mass movements possible inside and outside Parliament. We need to be active in every community. We need to be active in every trade union. So what do we need to be demanding? I think there are three key points. Firstly, we've got to force a different path in the fight against COVID, because whilst now there's light at the end of the tunnel on the pandemic uh, because of the good news in relation to the pace of development uh, of vaccines, this phase of the crisis is set to last for at least another year as those vaccines are rolled out uh, in completeness. And we can't go on like this for another year. The way the government has approached this crisis has been appalling. There's been tens of thousands of avoidable deaths. Our government's disastrous COVID response to this pandemic hasn't just led to the highest rate of excess deaths in Europe. We're also the hardest hit economy in the G7, but it doesn't have to be like this. There are countries that have successfully eliminated the virus and they're reaping the rewards with far lower deaths, far less economic impact, and people now being able to get back much more to their normal lives. Those countries in East Asia and the Pacific have pursued an eradication strategy known as zero COVID, which seeks to lock down cases rather than locking down whole countries. So the fight to defend public health and the fight for a fairer economy are intrinsically linked. So that's why booting out Serco and booting out other failing private contractors out of test and trace is so vital. The NHS and local public uh, health experts, they must be put in charge because getting that system working properly is vital to protecting people's lives and vital to protecting people's livelihoods. But that's not enough because even if the testing and contacting system worked, we know that people can't afford to isolate. Our statutory sick pay is one of the lowest in Europe, but just a fifth of the average workers' weekly earnings, according to the TUC. And that's why, with 30 other MPs this week, I called on the government to increase sick pay to a real living wage level. This is a demand that our whole movement must take up. Nobody Nobody should have to choose between putting food on the table and their health. The second point is the fight for a package of emergency measures to protect people from the worst excesses of this crisis. We've got to fight tooth and nail for a proper people's bailout. The banks were bailed out, so why shouldn't our communities be bailed out? That should include nobody on furlough being paid less than the minimum wage. The number of workers paid less than the minimum wage has increased fivefold this year to over two million people. It should include boosting social security to cover real living costs. It should include rent relief. It should include giving all public sector workers a pay rise. It should include raising the minimum wage to 10 pounds an hour. This is the bare minimum that our communities need. So I've launched a campaign to ensure that nobody on furlough is paid less than the minimum 
wage. Over 10,000 people have so far signed up to my campaign, so it would be great if everyone on this meeting tonight could sign up to it too. Finally, we need to go beyond the package of emergency measures. We need to offer an alternative vision for our economy because the crisis is so severe and so deep that the Tories will use it. They'll use it to attempt to restructure our economy even further in the interests of the privileged few. We've already seen during this crisis the way public money has been siphoned off to private firms, often firms with links to top Tories. A public inquiry into this is absolutely essential, but we need to go much further. We need to make the case for, and also fight for, a state that works in the interests of the many. That means a state that has real answers to the crises of unemployment, of growth, of low incomes. We know that the markets cannot meet these challenges. We need to be outlining how a huge program of public works is needed to create full employment, to boost incomes and to meet the challenges of our time. That means addressing the climate emergency with state-led investment in a Green New Deal to provide over a million new green jobs. Crucially, many of those green jobs can be highly skilled, which is exactly what parts of our country that have lived through decades of managed deindustrialization so badly need. And it means huge investment to rebuild local government and our wider public services so we are better prepared for the next crisis. And when the government tries to claim that there's no money for such necessities, we must be clear that Tory governments always find the money for their wrong priorities. For example, the £16 billion additional military spending, which could be used to build council houses, creating jobs and meeting a desperate social need. And we need to be clear that growth is the best way to get the debt down and that we can afford to invest, especially given the low cost of borrowing at the moment. So the challenge that we face is significant. And I'll finish on this. The Labour Party and the whole Labour movement has a crucial role to play in fighting to define the responses to these crises and to make sure that these crises aren't paid for on the backs of the working class. All of us, those in Parliament, those in our trade union movement, those on this call, all of us together have a job to do to win that kind of change. I believe that we can do so if we work together, which I know everyone on this call is willing to do and is going to do. Thank you very much. Seem to have muted myself. Thank you so much, Richard, and, and that was uh, insightful, inspiring, and also comprehensive in terms of what we are seeing with this spending review and you know the the the, the need to ensure that we have this plan which puts people first over over profit. Um, you mentioned so much there, and one of the things I picked up was about you know bailouts, you know, and, and, you know, if the government was going to bail out any sector, you know, what, what kind of sector it should be, for example, and, you know, we've seen previously what they've done with uh, bailing out banks. And I was just thinking about this in light of what's happening in terms of our universities and, and the higher education sector. Um, you, you and, and many, uh, many of the people watching today and tuning in today will be aware of universities where we're seeing redundancies and, and plans to you know, restructure as a result of uh, funding crises in, in the education system and, and the education sector. Um, how do we fight that fight fight back on that? You know, when they're sort of saying, "Oh, you know, look, we're we're really struggling. We you know we we've got to make these really difficult decisions." Um, how do we actually respond to that as activists and support those who are actually you know leading the way in the workplaces and trying to protect the education system from also being further privatized? That's an important point. I mean, we need to stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with the trade unions to defend every single job and to defend people's uh, pay uh, terms and conditions. And the university sector uh, is a wonderful example or rather a terrible example of exactly where neoliberal thinking ends up. Once you treat uh, education as a commodity, you end up with a grotesque situation uh, that uh, we see. So I know that uh, you, Apsana, uh, and other MPs have been working very closely in your communities uh, with 
uh, unions, both in the university sector, uh, the FE sector, uh, and uh, the NEU, for example, uh, in our schools uh, as well. So that's just one example of the kind of campaign that we need to be uh, involved in because people in communities across the country um, are seeing when it comes to whether it's their own uh, future or the future of their uh, children, they're coming to see the effects uh, of the Tory way of doing things, the effects of this rotten system and the effect of really a free market uh, fundamentalism. And one thing which would ensure, or one thing which would ensure that we don't do that job of work that you just outlined, is if we allow um, uh, ourselves to be um, kind of seduced into thinking that a tinkering around the edges managerialist approach uh, is enough. That kind of approach isn't enough outside a crisis, never mind uh, in a crisis. So we've got to be clear, uh, the money is there for the state to uh, step in and support jobs, support living standards, support services, because as I said just a moment ago, there was a £16 billion uh, additional spend uh, in military um, spending announced by uh, the government, uh, chasing the headlines of right-wing newspapers, I'm sure, but this is a government which is failing to support all people, and this is a government which was resisting uh, the campaign to expand free school meals uh, into the holidays because they said there wasn't enough money uh, there or it was too expensive. So I think that's a, a really great example. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. And we've got a question from um, uh, those watching on Facebook about um, the government committing to spend on the military. Um, you know, how do we make the case and how do we fight back on that? Um, you know, and, and make the case that in these this money should be actually spent on public services, investing in our future, investing in things like the Green New Deal. I mean, I don't uh, welcome that uh, record increase uh, in military uh, spending. Uh, it alarms me. Um, and I think Tony Benn once said, uh, if you've got enough money to uh, bomb people or kill people, you've got enough money to uh, feed people. And I think the free school meals which was a very small amount of money to extend it into the holidays. You see the resistance from the government on that. And yet the government has forged ahead uh, with this uh, record increase of £16 billion in military spending. And I think that uh, as a left, uh, we've got to make the argument uh, that a better uh, world is possible. Uh, I now received a message from someone I know uh, whose husband uh, is actually um, uh, in the armed forces and they have no confidence at this extra money is about uh, sorting out the uh, the pay uh, of um, of um, rank and file um, squaddies, for example. You know, it's about uh, something else. So as an Aaron Bevan said, socialism is a language of priorities. Now, priority has to be supporting people through this crisis, but building a better society out of this crisis. That means more council houses, uh, a Green New Deal with well-paid, uh, high-skilled, secure jobs. Uh, it means boosting uh, the benefits uh, system and it means boosting uh, the minimum wage. It means mobilising uh, the forces of the state and the power of the state to ensure that people in our communities and the working class in all its diversity uh, is properly supported. And I think the example of the record increase in military spending uh, and the opposition to um, expanding free school meals is a real, real world example of where you end up if you have a government with the wrong priorities. Thank you so much, Richard. And, and I'm sure all of our uh, viewers appreciate everything that you've said in terms of what we can go away and think about. And I, you know, I think reflecting on the last few months of, of, of being in parliament, um, you know, we, we, we've often talked about this and, and um, we've talked about the fact that, you know, we can see the government is eroding human rights and is, you know, is uh, delivering hostile environment uh, here in this country and also abroad. And, you know, one of the ways in which we can oppose this huge, you know, hyper military agenda that the government have is also to oppose some of the bills that they're putting forward in parliament, like the overseas operations bill, which we in the party ended up opposing at third reading after much campaigning, after much speaking out on it at second reading. And those are the things that are really important for us as parliamentarians to take away. Um, and, you know, we saw and we listened to members and activists on this uh, throughout that period as well. So I'm going to now go on to our final speaker for this evening.
Um, it gives me uh, great pleasure to invite um, to speak uh, Don McDonald, the former Shadow Chancellor. Um, and I'm sure everyone is really excited to hear from you about the spending review. I'm sure, no doubt, you recognise many of the things that have been announced today from last year's manifesto. Over to you, John. Thanks a lot, Absana. Look, um, before I say anything about the spending review, I, no Labour Party meeting should take place at the moment without us making the demand for the reinstatement of Jeremy Corbyn. And also, no, I don't think any Labour meeting should take place without making it absolutely clear that we believe in free speech in our movement. We always have done. And therefore, those constituencies that have been suspended or those constituency officers that have been suspended or party members that have been suspended for simply wanting to talk about Jeremy's suspension should be reinstated. I think I don't think we should allow any meeting to take place without addressing that. We stand, let's be absolutely clear, we stand in full solidarity with Jeremy Corbyn, comrade and friend. Um, let me talk about um, let me talk about today's today's spending review. It's interesting that you said that, Apsana, because George Eaton from um, New Statesman put out a tweet this evening of listing all the policies that um, Sunak has stolen from Labour's manifesto. Some at the weekend said that actually the, um, the Labour Party under Jeremy and the economic uh, programme that was developed under me was possibly the the best think tank the Tories have had in a generation because of the way in which they're stealing our ideas. And I said, well, yeah, they're talking about a national investment bank, rewriting the green book, the treasury green book we're putting forward, um, moving the treasury into government departments out of London, the whole issue about massive um, infrastructure investment, et cetera. It's true, but I said tonight, really, it's like someone, it's like watching someone steal your car crash the gears, not get out of first gear and then drive off in the wrong direction because that's what will happen and eventually, you know as well as I do, they certainly won't well, deliver. Um, interesting today, let's just talk about the spending review today just, uh, as briefly as possible. Um, the, the backdrop to it is, I don't know whether people saw Prime Minister's question time or, uh, or whether um, you heard some of Sunak's speech. The slogan that they were using, they've been using in a number of... Um, speeches and documents is the people's priorities. This is all about the people's priorities. Well, as Richard has spelled out really, um, what the spending review d demonstrated, just how distant those Johnson and Chancellor, are, uh, and Chancellor Sunak are from having any relationship or understanding of people's experiences or people's priorities. And I think, you know, you, uh, my, you know, they've obviously spent a lot of money in developing some of these slogans, but you know, the people's priorities bears no relationship today to stuff as Richard said that there's a million people have lost their job over the last six months. And millions, millions other than losing their jobs have had their wages cut. And if and if you're a I'll take a couple of examples, slogans like that are meaningless. To, for example, my constituents at Heathrow are about to go on strike because thousands of them have been fired and attempt to rehire them and cut their wages and undermine their working conditions. It's slogans like that are completely meaningless. If you're a Unite member up in Barn Oldswick, Barlick, I used to work in the town up in uh, northwest Lancashire, who Rolls Royce now have just laid off before Christmas and they're shipping their jobs abroad in the new year to Singapore. So the, this it just demonstrated to me just how Sunak has no understanding of what ordinary working people are going through. And the other aspect that they put in their literature that they put out was that this was gonna be a spending re review of jobs and opportunity. But these words become meaningless. If you're struggling to get along on what the government call a living wage, but is not a living wage you can actually live on. Or if you're, exactly as Sarah said, if you're dependent on sick pay, which if people need to remember, it's only a few months ago that um, Hancock, the Secretary of State for Health, when he was asked, can you live, can you survive on this level of sick pay? On the Andrew Marshall, he admitted he couldn't and neither could 
anybody else. What was interesting in the um, in the debate today as well of what was missing, I've just come from a meeting with PCS and they have a large number of members in the cultural sector, freelance. And there's 3 million people who've been excluded from all levels of support, either furlough support, job retention scheme, or other aspects of support as well. 3 million of those have been excluded and they've not, not even mentioned today by the not even mentioned today by the Chancellor. And I tell you, any you, Absami, you'll know this as well as I do, and Richard, any Labour MP will tell you at the moment that mo many of our constituents are now racking up high levels of personal debt. And you know, that they've got they've run through what little savings they they had. And the in fact, if you look at the statistics, not many people have got savings beyond a month's wages these days. But having done that, they've mounted up. And the figure we got just at the end of July was £6 billion increase, £6 billion increase in personal debt. What does that mean to people? Well, um, Step Change, the charity that deals with debt, did a report, and I was shocked at the figures and I had to check them again. But there's something like 100,000 people a year who, are con who contemplate suicide as a result of debt. Uh, that's the situation that, that we and there was no... There was no recognition at all by Sunak today of what was happening in the in the real world, and you know they refuse to use the word austerity now. And Johnson has banished it, um, but austerity is continuing. Dismal levels of child benefit, child benefit. You know, seventy percent of our children in poverty are in families where someone is at work. The figure is four million children in poverty and rising. And it's as a result of you know, families having to live off appalling levels of universal credit, which is about to be cut by another £20 next year. Um, yeah, the issues around sick pay themselves, but also the continuing continuation of the bedroom tax and the benefit cap, etc. So what we're seeing is rising levels of poverty and hardship, in-work poverty, and also the children. And there was no mention of that today. There was absolutely no mention of that whatsoever. And then, as Richard has said, then you get this attempt to divide and rule where effectively a pay freeze has been introduced. It's a pay freeze for teachers and firefighters and police officers. But that, having a pay freeze for them won't do anything to lift the wages of private sector workers. This isn't about levelling up, as they keep on talking about. This is about levelling down. And then nauseatingly, and it is nauseating, they continue to use the slogan, build back better, when they're not building back better, they're continuing to demolish. And they're particularly the institutions they're demolishing at the moment are the local institutions of local government. And there's a pittance of an allocation of resources today. And the, again, there'll be increases in council tax that will fall on the backs of um, local councils to determine. But we're in a situation now where the social care costs haven't been addressed. And we've seen already this year, councils effectively move into bankruptcy, so which results in further cuts in local services. What we've been trying to say and campaign for <clears throat> is basically that actually that we can win the argument about what the alternative should be. And we can mobilize people to across the country in individual communities, nationally, locally, regionally, we can mobilize uh, people to argue for that alternative. And what people need now more than anything, having endured nine tough months, is a restoration, I think, of confidence. And that means, I think, giving people guarantees. So we've been arguing that there should be a minimum income guarantee for everybody. Um, and that should be based upon a real living wage. And it should be linked to a jobs guarantee for all those who are capable of work. And that jobs guarantee should be linked to education and training as well, free, scrapping tuition fees, um, bringing back the EMA, the education maintenance allowance, supporting people so that they can train and gain the skills that they need. That's the sort of 
policy there, we can give people the security that they did and give them hope for the future. And just on the issue of debt, in 2008, people might remember that the government introduced a device for the banks where they took the bad debts of the banks and they set them to one side and the government took them over. If it was good enough for the banks in 2008, it should be good enough to take over those debts that have been accumulated by ordinary working people as a result of the COVID crisis. The argument then was that the banks were too big to fail. Well, we're talking about millions of our fellow citizens and they're cumulatively as a group too big to fail and we shouldn't let them go into that level of hardship and suffering that debt is causing at the moment. The discussion today that they put forward was about jobs. Well, we didn't see much evidence of job creation. And I thought what was deeply ironic was that when Rishi Sunak announced that there'd be a significant increase in expenditure for the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, I, the reason I found it ironic because that money is going to job advisors to advise people to go for jobs that don't exist. And if you talk to people around the country where people are applying for jobs, they're in competition with two, three, four, five hundred people also going for that same individual job. Good jobs will come, but they'll only come from high and stable levels of investment to grow the economy. But that growing of the economy has to be growing a sustainable economy. That's why we argue for a green industrial revolution. But what was, I think, a matter of almost historic disgrace today was the feeble levels of investment that are actually being identified by this government, particularly in relation to tackling climate change. Already, some of you will remember at the beginning of this year, the Climate Change Committee, the government's own committee, told it actually it was not meeting the targets it needed. And effectively now, they're not even going to meet their target of net zero carbon in 2050, when we know it should at least be brought forward to 2040 and realistically 2030. But I just think future generations will look back on today along with other decision-making days by Trump and Johnson as acts of betrayal. And you know what's gonna come if we don't tackle climate change. It'll be California fires. It'll be the flooding that we've experienced in the global South. It will be lack of food supplies, mass migration as people move out of areas that are affected by the disaster of climate change catastrophe. And I, I don't think future generations will ever forgive what John Cern and Trump and others have done by delaying the action that we need to take against climate change. The government promised <clears throat> this leveling up process whereby investment outside of London um, would be leveled up, infrastructure investment would be leveled up outside of London to the levels of London, the Southeast. It's one of our policies. And actually, it's one of the ones that we instigated nearly four and a half years ago. And we launched it in a conference up in Liverpool. We exposed the low level of investment outside of London and we said we would introduce a program with, which would enable it to happen. It was all going to be green sustainable investment. What's interesting, the figures today go nowhere near that. But what's also interesting as well is you can put investment into an economy and you can replicate maybe the levels of investment in London and Southeast if you're determined enough and you can replicate that around the country. But what they're doing is with the investment, they're also replicating the nature of the London economy as well. Because what, without trade union rights and without, as, Pascal, as, as said, without public ownership as well, what will you replicate is the same levels of inequality, exploitation that you'll, we experience in London too. So it isn't just about investment, it's about structural change. And that structural change needs to be on the basis of the restoration of basic rights so people can have a voice at work in which they can negotiate redistribution of wealth, company by company, sector by sector. There was a report leaked, some of you may have seen it in The Guardian today, from the government's own cabinet office, which basically says that we're facing a systemic crisis as a result of the impact of pandemic and also as a result of the mishandling of Brexit and negotiations themselves. Well, today the spending review did nothing to reassure people that that crisis could be averted, either in the short term, or we were laying the foundations 
to face up to the existential crisis of climate change. And what was interesting is Sunak said nothing about fiscal planning for the future, when in reality, um, what that means is uncertainty. And what uncertainty does is it sends the speculators effectively into the bookies, making bets on in the city of London about what future fiscal policy will be. It's a speculator's dream. So large numbers of people as a result of today, large numbers of wealthy people as a result of his failure to be clear about the fiscal plan for the future, will be making large amounts of money on bets that they'll place on the future of our economy. What we needed today was, if not the detail, at least setting out the principles of the way forward and the principles that we've always established is, actually, yes, there will be continuing borrowing, but it will be paid for as a result of sustainable economic growth, environmentally sustainable economic growth. It will be paid for as a result as well of a fair taxation system where the corporations and the rich will pay their fair share. None of that was heard today. So I think actually today wasn't just a disappointment. It was reckless and irresponsible. But what got to me the most, I suppose, really angered me. And again, I won't forgive them for the sort of final measure announced of cutting overseas aid meant that actually on a day like today, this government has taken resources away desperately needed by the poorest of our fellow human beings on the planet. That confirmed to me that not just our lack of leadership by or vision or moral commitment by Johnson and Sunak, it confirmed me that actually what we have leading this country, brutes, brutes whose brutality now will impact upon, as I say, some of those most hard pressed right the way across the planet, as well as failing to live up to the responsibilities they have for our own people who have experienced such hard and tough times over the last nine months. Anyway, what we'll be doing now is the point that Richard and yourself, Absana, have made time and time again in meeting after meeting, and Sarah from the, un from the Baker's Union as well, which is a shiny example of it, and Pascal from We Own It. As a movement now, we come together and we campaign to expose what the Tories have done, but also to provide that alternative. And that's our responsibility. Solidarity. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm just picking up on a few of the comments um, that have been coming through throughout this evening, one of which is from Caroline, who says, addressing uh, statutory sick pay is extremely important. However, for some, they may end up on ESA, which is £20 a week less than statutory sick pay. And you know, we cannot address one issue without addressing the other. And also from Jackie, who says, you know, we shouldn't keep peddling this myth around money trees because the government is borrowing from itself. Its money does not work like a household budget um, and it can raise money from taxes unlike the rest of us. So quite important comments there, I think, just to kind of outline where things stand. John, I've got a couple of questions for you. And, and the first one really is around, I mean, you, you um, have been calling for uh, the nationalization of care and to establish the National Care Service alongside the NHS. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that and, and what do you think you know, should have been happening today in terms of a commitment in the long run? I mean, this pandemic has obviously exposed what happened well, in our care homes. It's yeah. exposed how we've you know, really um, left behind and, and made um, our elderly and, and those that need personal care as well um, really out in, in, in the cold. And, and where do things stand in terms of that now? For th well, for three solid years, when there's been a budget or a spending review statement, we've raised the issue of social care. Eight billion, eight billion cut from social care um, since 2010. There's nothing there today that, that assisted us in any way. Can I also mention, you've got, to, you've got to remember this isn't, people think this is just about elderly. It isn't. It's about support for disabled people, but also one of the areas that they savaged, and there was a massive increase in children coming into care because of the cuts to children's services, early interventions to support families, so that then when families break down, children get taken in, into care. So what we've been campaigning for, first of all, the, the reinstatement of the funding, eight billion at least, but also working with the Women's Budget Group, working with the Socialist Health Association, working with Keep the NHS Public, and also working um, with uh, Deepak 
we've been looking at the proposals for an overall national care and support service. And it's about establishing a national care and support service on the same principles of the NHS, which is uh, paid for by direct taxation, free at the point of need. Um, the discussion that's been taking place is to make sure it's properly funded, but also to make sure actually it is co-determined, co-designed by the people who receive the service as well as the people who deliver it. And it's based upon very much upon localities too. And in that way, we can provide a, we can provide a service for all those people who need support throughout their lives. And again, it's, it's not rocket science. In fact, the Attlee government would have done this if it had been in office a little bit longer. So it's almost the completion of the work of Nye Bevan and others to make sure that we've got that service. But it's about working with local government and the NHS and bringing that together. There's a number of people who've raised the issue about um, the voluntary sector involvement. Of course, there's always been voluntary sector involvement in the NHS as well as within social care. And you want to draw upon all those, uh, all those support for mutual aid projects as well. Um, the good thing of, about the budget issues, the economic issues around this, there's just last year they did it and this year they've done it even in more depth. The Women's Budget Group did a fantastic report about if you actually invest in social care and you make sure people are paid, paid properly, you also invest in ensuring that there is a professional training available to people that, that, that need it and want it. You actually, the, the more you invest in social care, actually you gain more economic benefits than you would actually at the moment in investing in some industrial site, in industrial developments too. And the, the report that they produce is extremely hard hitting, ignored by government, absolutely ignored by government, was in our last two manifestos. But now, uh, again, what we should be doing now is making sure we're working to lobby within the party that it becomes absolute rock solid policy for the future and that we start planning and working at the local level about how that will be developed, now, and not just nationally, but locally as well, and using as much as we possibly can in terms of where we're in control in local councils to develop those ideas. So when Labour goes into government next, we hit the deck running on its implementation. I think it could be, uh, it could be world changing for lots of individuals and their families, but actually I think also for the community and economy overall, it will in many ways, you know, it will enable us to have a, a vibrant community that is, um, in some ways, in terms of economic impact, could be quite, I think, significant in increasing the demand that we need within the economy and also spreading the wealth within the economy as a result of better wages for social care. Thank you so much, John. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to now come back to our first speaker just to sum up, um, if, if you can, in terms of the plan going forward and, and what the people's plan should look like for protecting jobs and livelihoods. So I'm going to come over to Sarah first. Thank you. I think just to sum up, I mean, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of comments about how we break through the lies of the mainstream media um, to get people on board, to give people hope. And I think it's just about communicating with people, isn't it? You know, talk to people in your everyday, um, everyday lives, whether you're at work, um, events such as this uh, are vitally important to get the truth out there you know there is money and it shouldn't be the working class that are paying for it and campaigns like ours around statutory sick pay um, as, as well as many other union campaigns that are going on are important to challenge the government and let them know that you know we're not just going to sit back and accept the crap that they're giving to us we are the 99 percent we have got the power and and people just need to remember that you know um because when they do god help boris Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for all the work that you're doing and the work that the Bakers Union is doing as well. So I'm going to go over to Pascal now. So a quick summary, if you can, on, on our plan, the people's plan for protecting jobs and livelihoods. Yeah, thanks so much again for having me. It's been amazing. Um, I think just to build on what Sarah said and what lots of us have, have been talking about, this is we need to just fight on our terms we need to not fight against their their language and myth bust we we know what the the alternatives are and we've been talking about some amazing ideas on this call and I'm really heartened um to know that that we are going to make it happen eventually and there are lots of people here tonight that are going to fight for what we need thank you so much 
Great. Thank you so much, Pascal. And over to you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much. And it's, I think, uh, this meeting tonight, uh, we've heard from different, different aspects uh, and different parts of this uh, struggle. We've heard from Pascal at We Own It, a vital work that they do, putting forward the case of public ownership in a way that people can understand, in a way that people can recognise the way it benefits them and their communities. We've heard from the trade union movement, from uh, Sarah Woolley, who's doing a fantastic job uh, with the BFA at WU. Uh, uh, and we've heard uh, from, of course, um, some parliamentarians, some MPs, as well, always great to hear from Apsana and John McDonnell. And then the final ingredient, of course, are all the people on this call. And we need everyone, speakers and the attendees on this call, those who've asked questions, or just been, those who've just been watching, listening in, to work uh, together for the purpose of pushing this uh, people's uh, plan. It goes to the core of our politics. And as this crisis develops, this economic crisis develops, the kind of policies we've had in 2017 and 2019 are more relevant than ever before. And the policies in this people's plan are acutely relevant, not as some remote theoretical matter, but something relevant in the here and now on a bread and butter basis, a practical basis for the lives of the working class in all its diversity, but also for the future. Uh, we've heard about climate change tonight. Uh, we've heard about the, the need to build back better uh, out of this uh, crisis. So let's carry on working together uh, through this and let's get even more people to sign up to the People's Plan because it contains the concrete demands that are necessary. They're relevant to people. They're um, what we need to be organising round as a propositionalist practical left movement that has the answers to the problems people are facing in this historic crisis. Thank you so much, Richard. And lastly, John. Um, uh, like Richard, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I took the view that I, I don't do stand up anymore. I do, you just go along, do a speech and then bugger off and nothing happens. Every, every word we say, every speech we make should lead to action. There's two actions I want people to think about. Uh, one is, um, this issue of debt, um, we've got large numbers of people now absolutely in dire circumstances because of debt, and we've got to try and secure a write-off of that debt in the same way they did for the banks. Tomorrow evening, I'm involved in this project called Claim the Future. Tomorrow evening, we've got a group of the debt experts coming together to talk through the ideas around that. So if you go on the Claim the Future website, come along to that meeting because from that, we'll be launching ideas, but also a campaign around debt itself. The other thing as well, just to go back to on Friday, i oh, sorry, on Saturday at 5 p.m., there's this rally to support Jeremy Corbyn, his reinstatement. Come along, I think um, Richard's chairing, I think, well, at least speaking at it, Matt Wilgress and yourself, and absolutely yourself. It's absolutely key that people take the action of joining that so we can demonstrate in numbers, large numbers, the need for Jeremy to now thanks a lot thank you so much john so thank you so much to all of our guest speakers and for everybody for to part, for participating in today's event we know we have important battles ahead of us and we also know just how important our campaigning for people health and the planet is in terms of putting that uh, first we must build the resistance to the Tories and popularize socialist alternatives. And we must keep working together to insist that there is no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and our politics. And to argue for the immediate public health and economic support measures people need. So on that point, I just want to appeal to everybody that's tuned in today to please uh, donate at the link that's been provided on your stream so we can continue to keep hosting these important events. And of course, please do sign and share the people's plan. And as John has mentioned and as others have mentioned, the next Arise event um, is on Saturday, on the 28th of November at 5 p.m. Uh, jointly uh, being hosted with Momentum, and it is about restoring the whip to Jeremy Corbyn, a comrade, a friend, you know, the lead, one of our lead, great leaders of our movement. And as somebody who was elected in 2019, I have had the privilege and honour um, standing uh, side by side, opposing uh, the Tory government policies and laws, 
And he has, you know, despite all of these different challenges that he's been facing over the last year, um, he's never, ever erred. And he's always been there, you know, standing up against these terrible bills. We had lots of conversations on the spy cops bill. We had lots of conversations on the overseas operations bill. And Jeremy is just as he was when he was leader with us always. He's always been with us. We've always must be with him. And so I look forward to seeing you on Saturday at the next Arise event. Thank you, solidarity, and good evening.